Hi guys, uh, this is Aditya again and uh, as promised last time today we've brought, come with another video and this time we'll be talking about um, the experiences that we've all had while moving to the UK uh, and we've got different experiences of uh, me coming alone and Anir we've got Anirudh who came in with his wife and uh, Swamya who came in with the family and uh, we're just going to talk about today about how to set yourself up in the, in the UK and uh, what it is uh, coming in through different programs and how to set up a family and uh, with just day-to-day -day living as a sort. Uh, so we're going to start off with how I came in essentially as you all know that you came in through the tier two visa through the MCH uh, program which was through the Edgehill University and uh, WWL uh, and uh, Soumya came in through the same uh, process and Anirudh came in after his MRCS exam. So I'm going to leave it to Soumya to explain uh, to you know just give talk about how it was coming in with dependents and how to bring them along to the UK. Okay. Uh, hi guys, it's uh, nice to catch up with Aditya and Anirudh. Uh, I will just be telling about uh, first about the tier two visa, which is what I came in through as well. Uh, I came uh, I came in alone first, and uh, my husband and my child joined me a few months later as my tier two dependent. So I came in alone. Uh, stayed on a hospital accommodation, sorted out what were the, the rent and the house and everything, which we will talk about uh, shortly. And, and then my family came in after a few months. Uh, with regards to coming as a, a dependent, uh, the entire tier two dependent uh, spouse is, has uh, work, is work permitted uh, to work either as a in the NHS as a doctor or in, in any other profession full time job as a full time job. In the NHS, you can work in any non training position, but uh, you can't get into uh, either you can't get into a dental or a NHS training. And uh, from what uh, I've heard about those who come from, from tier five visas, those who come as tier five, uh, and their dependents, uh, as far as uh, my knowledge goes, uh, they cannot work more than 20 hours a week and definitely not as uh, doctors in the NHS. They can probably do uh, other jobs, but not more than 20 hours per week. But this is something that needs to be checked on the uh, gov.uk website and with the UKY. But, but tier two dependent, I'm quite uh, sure about what I mentioned. Sure. So how difficult was it, Soumya, for you to organize a visa for, uh, for your family? Uh, it's not it's quite straightforward. Organize uh, getting the uh, gov.uk and the UKVI's website has quite straightforward details. The documents that are required are pretty much the same, right, from your police clearance to the TB certificate and and things like that. However, your dependent doesn't need an IELTS. Uh, yeah, in my case, yeah, because my husband uh, is uh, also in the medical profession, he had an IELTS anyway. But uh, you don't need an IELTS for your tier two dependent spouse. And uh, for a child, probably uh, it's you just need a TB certificate and the joint parents would need to sign a declaration, self-declaration saying that they will take care of the financial expenses and not use public funds. Yeah, one thing at the tier two is you should know you're not allowed to use any public funds. Yes, I think that's a very important point that you raised. Yeah, just to add on, um, add on to what we've already uh, spoken about. So um, you can come together as well. Uh, so all you, your dependent will need um, to come along with you is your certificate of sponsorship number. And um, obviously, it's uh, like Soumya said, it's quite uh, quite a straightforward application um, on, on, on the gov.uk website. Um, the other thing is how long is that visa valid for? So um, it's simply for as long as your, uh, your employing trust sponsors you for. So generally, um, I was initially sponsored for a year. So my tier two visa lasted for a year. But if you have a contract that is for longer, your visa obviously lasts for, uh, you know, as long as your contract, your contract lasts. And that's for a tier two dependent? Uh, yes. So, um, yeah. That's, 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 that's generally the same. So the home office sometimes, uh, you know, I, I have found that they give different, uh, you know, the, the, the expiry date of, of, of the BRP card that is eventually issued can be quite different. Um, but essentially it is, you know, it is for the time that your sponsor is, uh, is sponsoring your visa. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Right, right, great. So- yeah, uh, just 
one small point to add in this. Suppose if you come in a job that's like three years, like how me and Aditya came, and probably after one year, you as a primary visa holder changes your job, but your dependence BRP is still valid for another, for example, in our case, another two years. Then once, the, suppose after first year, the primary changes the job, gets another COS. Then dependence can remain as long as the primary has a job, has is working, they can remain on their current valid visa. Yeah. Right. So the other thing um, before moving is obviously <clears throat> uh, searching for a home, which is, uh, you know, something that needs to be sorted out. Um, when you when you move, you, you should have an idea. So Aditya, um, how how did you go about looking for a home? Is it something that can be done sitting in India or how, how should one go about that? So I think uh, the resources available are pretty much the same for all of us. Uh, even when I was in India, I started looking into uh, places through the common websites, the most important being uh, Rightmove and Zoopla. Uh, I think those are the most two important resources that we have uh, that we can find to rent a place. But obviously the needs and requirements of looking for a kind of place will vary with the number of people that you bring in. For me, it was easiest to stay in the hospital accommodation for the first few months uh, and uh, you know, understand the job requirements, my day-to-day my -day travel requirements. And once I had that figured out, then I moved on to a place uh, which was convenient for me uh, as an individual to live in near the hospital. Yeah. Um, um, so uh, what, uh, I'll, I'll share my experience. So I was initially uh, staying in a hotel and then figured out, you know, my my job. And um, so before, so we will talk about what all is required for renting, but um, I initially stayed in a hotel, sorted out all the documentation that was required to, to first rent a place, and then eventually started looking on, on the same websites, as you mentioned, um, for a home. Uh, and I found that was um, much easier to do it for, in, in my case, when I was personally there in the UK. And uh, what about you, Samia? Yeah, I guess the websites and the things are same. My inputs would be in terms of where, if you're coming with a child and or you're looking for a place with a child, not every hospital accommodation has a married accommodation. If they have, then well and good. Mm -hmm. But uh, like other, my hospital accommodation was only for singles. It was not for married. The, they didn't have the insurance and the, uh, and the structure for have a child. Uh, so in that case, how would you look? Uh, my concern was where should I look? Should the house be close should I take a house close to the hospital and and based on if I was my based on my experience uh, suppose if you have a child that is not school going that is uh, up to uh, prior to age four uh, that we call uh, toddlers it's better to take it uh, close to where one of the parents is working this I'm, I'm, I'm at this I'm telling in the sense that both the parents are working if both the parents are working then it's better to take a house close to where one of the parents has a bit of a flexibility in in going and attending to an emergency in case a child has. Suppose your school is uh, into the school going age, that is from reception year four or five, then uh, you will obviously have to take a house uh, mm -hmm. close to a school, uh, something called as a school catchment area, which we will talk about sometime later in any of our videos. So yeah, then your choice of where you choose your house depends on that school, which school you choose and the catchment area. That's, that's absolutely correct. I think that's one of the most important things that people look into uh, when looking for a home, uh, especially when they have a child. I think uh, the, the school is one of the most important things that, uh, that decides where you live. Uh, other than that, is there anything else that you would specifically look for? The requirements uh, for renting, if you are working uh, in the NHS or any other job, uh, the requirements will be your British BRP or the BRP, your offer, offer letter. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's pretty much uh, they they ask for initially if you don't have uh, uh, you don't you're new to this country, and then they're going to do something called as a background check mm -hmm. with your employer to find out if uh, your salary details are okay. Will you be able to pay that rent? And uh, and and then once the checks come through, you should be able to move in. And uh, before moving in, you'll have to pay five weeks. Uh, of the rent uh, in advance along with the first uh, first month's rent. Uh, essentially that works as a deposit which you get back at the end of your contract. Yeah. Right. Okay. 
And uh, other than that, uh, just the offer letter, is that enough or something else that you need as well? Just your identification and uh, probably an offer letter. And Yeah, it, it, that's, this is for people who are coming into the country for the first time and you don't have any background at all uh, in, in this country. From, yeah. from what I had in my experience, I think the couple of things that they added on and asked for was uh, a couple of references from the hospital that I was working in, which, which I did provide. Uh, and they did uh, seem to call them up and find out uh, probably it was just a, a finance uh, or a salary check and a, a char character check that they do. Uh, was it the same for you, Anirudh, or did you have any other issues? Yeah, no, it's pretty much the same. I, I, I think I just want to mention that before renting, I think um, it is it is better if you have a you have a UK bank account because obviously you know your your um, your your renting agency will will want to know where exactly they're, they're, they're going to take the money from. Um, there's, there's a bit of um, a background detail and a credit check, which, which they normally do. But then for someone new to the country, obviously all that does not apply. Um, but basically to say, I think if you have a bank account in place first, um, then it, it, it makes it much more easier. So then coming into uh, just bank accounts, yeah. only, how, how easy yeah. is it uh, to open a bank account and, and how was it for you? Um, for me, initially, so I, like I said, I was um, I was I was staying in uh, in a hotel, and uh, initially they 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 wanted an address proof, mm -hmm. and they would not accept you know the fact that I was staying in a hotel. They, um, however, it was sorted out by my hospital thanks to the through the letter and you know basically saying that he's working with us. Uh, this, this is what his salary is going, going to be for the, for, for the year. And um, so that, that was all sorted out. So basically, you uh, hospitals generally know what to provide, <clears throat> especially the account section. Um, if you're new to the country, they know, they generally tend to know exactly what they need to provide you with. Um, and it's basically a standard uh, generic letter addressed to the bank, which uh, should normally work. And uh, was it the same for you as well, Samia? Yeah, it was the same. I'd just like to add a few things what I've heard from friends who are moving in now during the current COVID times and with quarantine. A uh, few banks like uh, Barclays is allowing people to, uh, once they move into UK, just during their quarantine period itself, on their phone, uh, they said they if they're on their GPS, the, the, the app picks up the GPS location mm -hmm. and they are allowing them to open a bank account right during their uh, quarantine period, period itself. And another thing, uh, which again, during COVID times to sort out accommodation, what people are doing is they're opening something called as a Monzo account online. Mm -hmm. That doesn't need you to show an address proof. And a few, uh, few letting agents are allowing the video as in Zoom viewing of the houses. And uh, allow, if you're able to pay from your parent country, they're even allowing you to probably straight away move into your accommodation. So that is an option that you can always speak with your agent as you're seeing as well. I think that's a very important point that you've picked up that because I recently moved homes as well, uh, uh, video um, viewings is a, is a very, very important part of uh, renting now. I think a lot of agencies have moved to that permanently. And other than that, I think uh, the other thing that you mentioned, Monzo is, is also something that's uh, coming up. It's, it's essentially an online bank. Uh, it doesn't have a physical presence, but there's someone available uh, through an app or someone on the other end of the phone, uh, which you could use. And they generally don't tend to require uh, an address proof. Uh, for me, it was uh, something similar. I think opening a bank account is one of the most important things that we need to do uh, as, as a priority as we move into the country, as it's uh, uh, as the documents that the bank provide and, uh, and a bank account is a proof of your existence in the UK on a document. And... Uh, uh, for me, it, I was able to get that account through uh, the same offer letter that you mentioned to the hospital, as well as uh, me staying in an accommodation which was provided by the hospital. And uh, right, and after that, I think uh, we can move on to the next important thing is uh, driving in the UK and its importance. Yeah, yeah. I probably, yeah, yeah, I will. Uh speak in terms of a child, if, if you are staying in a place where there isn't, the public transport is not that great, which is probably, except for London and surrounding areas, or in probably central Manchester or any major city might have a good uh, local transport. But otherwise, 
most other places uh, which are a few miles away from the city center then transport public transport is uh, is not that uh, frequent and uh, renting the uber or a taxi every day to work when if you have to suppose to drop your child to a child care place and then move then it, it does get expensive uh, so the first thing is if you if you need to learn to drive there's not much difference between driving in india and here in terms of the uh, it's both right handed uh, driving but the rules are different yes the earlier you get to drive and start driving uh, it is it is good i i'll leave it to aditya and anirudh to talk about uh, the how what about the international license and the rest of the things yeah so <clears throat> my experience i was uh, i was initially living in london because i was i was working in london so i as you rightly said i never felt the need of uh, of getting a car because public transport is so good in london you can literally get around the whole place um, you know ev ev everywhere is connected very well by the tube um and and the bus service um regarding the international license you can drive in the uk on your indian license you, you don't you don't need to have anything other than your indian license and you can drive on that for up to a year um now the thing is you have one year to to get a uk license which mean and for which you have to uh, do a theory exam and then you have to do a practical exam as well uh which is a driving test now the the theory exam is 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 not very difficult to crack but the practical driving test can be a little tricky um and that's simply because you know we from our from, from our home countries we we are not used to 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 this style of driving and um and and the DVLA here is quite strict about you know driving rules and 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 offenses <clears throat> so um the other thing is for people who are looking to move now i would advise them to try and book uh dates for their theory test and the, and the, and then the practical test as soon as possible because there's been a huge backlog uh after the pandemic and you know if if you apply today you might not get a date for the next 6 months so mm -hmm. it's a good idea to to try and do that sort that out as soon as possible that's absolutely yeah. correct as far as i know i think uh, 12 uh, after the 12th of april driving tests are going to resume um uh, there was a point where there was a priority for nhs workers i'm not sure if that's going to be the case afterwards as well uh with regards to opening a, uh, sorry with regards to getting a driving license as anirudh rightly said you have a year from the moment of your land into the uk uh, in which within which you can drive legally uh beyond that you need uh, the uk license and the way to get it is to apply for a provisional license through uh, dvla where you send in an original document such as your uh, passport or your uh, brp to them uh, and uh, for a cost and they provide uh, and that's as as easy as it gets and you get a provisional license after that you need to clear both the tests uh, theory as well as the practical and it's highly advisable that Uh, you do no matter how proficient you've been in driving in your country and how many years you've driven uh, it's it you do need uh, to get the motions right and uh, get some take some uh, proper classes and uh, uh, you know just go through the motions of giving the test like an mrcs you know uh, there are things that you have to show that you're doing and yeah. driving exam exactly the same that uh, you have to show the examiner that you're doing those things yeah and and just to think about the license uh the yes the indian uh, what were your parent country license is valid provided it is a smart card license if you are somebody who still has a license in a paper form uh, please convert it get an international license or convert it into a smart card license before you enter the country absolutely i think that's very very important uh, i think it's about 20 20 minutes now so i'm going to uh, cut the video for this i think uh, we've talked spoken about uh, how to settle in in the uk Uh, oh, I'm sorry. One of the last two things that we need to talk about is the bills and taxes that you have mm. to pay as uh, as you come into the UK. Anil, do you want to talk about that? Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think the most the most common ones that you have to do are your electricity and gas bills, mm -hmm. um, your water bills, um, your your council tax. Um, there's also a tv license so if you if you've got a tv um you know you have to, you have to pay for a tv license um 
and that's that's about all that I can think of. Obviously, then if you've got a car, you've got your car insurance uh, that you need to pay for monthly. Um, it is very important to to make sure. <clears throat> Uh, you've got your road tax if you're driving a car road as well. Tax. Yeah, exactly, exactly. You've got your road tax as well. Um, basically, I think overall, uh, it, it is very important to to pay all of these on time because uh, it affects your credit score as well. So you want to make sure that you either set up a, a direct debit or you make sure that you're paying all of these on time. I mean, it can be quite tricky to keep a track of all of them. Um, I find that a direct debit is, is the easiest way to pay. Um, how about you, Aditya? Any, any different experiences with these? Well, uh, not really. I think I would agree with all of those things. These are the regular bills and taxes that I, I'm usually paying. Uh, and uh, I'm sure Soumya would have something else. The to, add. And, and to add a broadband and, and yeah, that's, that's about it. And, and all these are something that you can stay in India itself and start sorting it out once your house is cleared. The, the bills and stuff you can once you you have a house you can start everything on all the numbers are available online if, if you're somebody who wants to be organized like again i'm telling in terms of moving with the family with the child together and uh, if you want to plan in advance and don't want to kind of uh, yeah. uh, it is a it is it is a daunting task to move in with the family so if you are somebody who wants who has the time in hand once you get a house you could sort this out with phone calls and stuff from india perfect all right, I think uh, so. I'm going to uh, wrap this up now. I, that was very, very uh, important conversation that we had, and I uh, thank you, Soumya, for joining us, and uh, Anirudh for shedding light on different things as well. Okay. All right. Yeah, thank you. Bye. Thanks. Thanks. Bye. Bye.